Time for a practice involving dot product, which also, of course, means talking about things like angle between vectors, projection, orthogonality. Wonderful things you can do with dot product. It's something which we're going to find very useful. Or to put it another way, dot we should remember. Of course, as you practice, it's important to do as much as you can on your own. If you're following along with the video, make use of the pause button. Try problems out on your own. And if you want some additional commentary, I'm happy to join you. And I'll, well, go off on a tangent or two probably. But of course, that's what makes me a good calculus teacher. All right, well, let's begin. Our first problem. Find all values, A, so that the cosine of some angle theta is 1, 6. Well, what's theta? Theta is the angle between the vectors 1, 2, 1, and a, comma, 1 minus a, comma, a minus 1. All right, so let's think about what we have. Well, we should really think of these, we can think of them temporarily, as we'll call it u and v. So we have two vectors, u and v. And what we have is we want 1, 6 to be cosine of theta, where theta is the angle between the two vectors. Whenever we see a problem that says cosine of an angle between two vectors, we should say, hey, that goes back to dot product. So we say, well, the cosine is u dot v divided by the magnitude of u and the magnitude of v. So let's uh, see what that becomes. a, 1 minus a, a minus 1, dot, 1, 2, 1. Divide by the magnitude, a, 1 minus a, a minus 1, times the magnitude, 1, 2, 1. All right. Well, that's something, right? Okay, so now we've got to sort of work, all right, let's use the product, let's take magnitude, and be careful. This looks like an algebra problem for right now. So upstairs, a times 1 would give us a. Then 1 minus a times 2. So if we distribute the 2 through, that would be 2 minus a. And here, 1 times a minus 1. Well, that would be plus a. Whoops, I forgot to multiply the 2 through both terms. Ah, see, that's 2 minus 2a. Ha, ha, ha. Check your work. Okay, and then a uh, and then minus 1. There we go. There's the top. And then downstairs, we have the square root. Here we'll have a squared plus 1 minus a squared plus a minus 1 squared. And then over here, the square root, 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 1 squared. Now, we take a look and say, well, can we simplify anything? Hmm. If, before we do that, let's actually do a little bit of expanding down here. 1 minus a squared is 1 minus 2a plus a squared. a minus 1 squared is a squared minus 2a plus 1. All right. Okay, that seems reasonable. And uh, all right, what's happening on the top? Let's start there. Well, once we remember that the 2 distributed through to both terms, you see there's an a, an a, and a minus 2a. So actually, all the a's end up canceling. Then there's a 2 and a minus 1. Well, that's simple. That's 1 over. And now, well, we have the square root. Let's gather. We have a squared, another a squared, and another a squared. That's 3a squared. Then we have a minus 2a and a minus 2a, so minus 4a. And then a, a 1 and another 1 plus 2. And then here we have the square root of 1 plus 4 plus 1. Well, that's the square root of 6. And remember, this is equal to 1 over 6. Okay, well, first thing, I don't like fractions. Fractions scare me. So one of the things I often look for is, is there a way to get rid of fractions? And so here, easy. Easy. We cross multiply. So if we do that, we'll get that 6 is equal to uh, 
the square root of 3a squared minus 4a plus 2 times the square root of 6. Now the other thing I, I don't like is I don't like square roots. And so we look and say, are there ways to get rid of square roots? Well, we could try squaring. Now, we can do it if we have an equation where we have something equals something. And here we do. So let's square both sides. So squaring both sides, we get 36 is equal to 3a squared minus 4a plus 2 times 6. Well, let's divide by the 6. So that 6 equals 3a squared minus 4a plus 2. And bring the 6 across. So now we're to the point where we have 0 is equal to 3a squared minus 4a minus 4. Good. All right. Now, at this point, we ask ourselves the question, well, does it factor? And if it does, how does it factor? Well, so we have to take a look at it here. And we say, if it factored, what would be true? Well, 3a, there's not a lot of ways to do that. That would be, have to be a, a 3a and an a. Now the 4, also not a lot of ways to do that. You could do a, a 4 and a 1. But if we did a 4 and a 1, what would happen is we'd either have a 12 and a 1. Well, that would combine together to give something odd. Or we would have a 4 and a 3, which would again combine together to be odd. So when I say combine together to be odd, what I'm referring to is this center term. So it would also have to be a 2 and a 2, if it, if it factored. So we're just sort of reasoning here. By the way, if you don't like reasoning, and you just say, throw it into the quadratic formula, right? Perfectly fine. If, if you like throwing it into the quadratic formula, that's great. Do it. Do what helps you solve the problem, because that's the most important thing, solving the problem. Now, at this point, we just have to say, okay, so if it is possible, one of these has to be plus and one has to be minus. Well, because I want to end up with a negative, I would say, well, the part that looks like it's going to be the larger part should be negative. So this would be a negative 6a. This would be a positive 2a. Now, let's, let's check. 3a squared, good, minus 6a plus 2a, minus 4a, and minus 4. Aha! 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 It worked! It worked! Okay. All right. So now, after all this work, we said, look, if, if we're looking for 1 6 is the cosine of the angle, and we got down and said, look, a has to satisfy this. So 3a plus 2 times a minus 2 has to be 0. Well, the only way that could happen is if either the 3a plus 2 equals 0, which says a would be negative 2 thirds, because I can subtract 2 divided by 3, or the a minus 2 would have to equal 0, which would say that a has to be positive 2. And so these are the two values for a. For a equals negative 2 thirds, or a equals positive 2, then we're going to get a nice angle between these two vectors. And that's it. That's kind of nice. Okay, cool. It worked out in the end to be not too bad. Okay, so another problem. Oh, a two-dimensional problem. All right, so we're given two vectors, u and v, and so u is the vector 2, negative 1, and v is the vector 4, 5. And what's the problem? Well, the problem says, find, if possible, some vector w so that if I project w onto u, I'm going to get u back. And if I project w onto v, I get v back. And at this point, we're like, huh. Okay. So in some sense, the we're looking for a vector w so that if I look at w, the amount of w pointing in the same direction as u is u. And the amount of w pointing in the same direction as v is v. And... Uh, at first glance, it seems like, is there such a vector? And how would this work? So we have to think about what's true. So let's think about 
what's going on here. Now, normally when we take a projection onto you, what would we have? Well, this would be the vector we're, we're taking the projection of, which is w dot u over u dot u, and then we multiply it by u. And in a similar way, same process here, only thing is it's now dot v, and v dot v times v. So this is just writing down the formula for the projections. So the only way this could work, if it did work at all, would be say, well, we're looking for some vector w where these quantities here would have to be 1. Because we need to end up with u, so that says that what's in front of here needs to be 1. Here we have to end up with v, so what's here has to be 1. So, all right, rewriting that, it says we really have two conditions that need to be satisfied. We need to have that w dotted with u is the same as u dotted with u. And we need to have that w dotted with v is the same as v dotted with v. So, good. Now, that's uh, progress, right? We've gone it down to sort of like saying, here's what we need. Let's think about our vector w. Let's give it a name. So, we don't know what w is. But it's two-dimensional because we're working in a two-dimensional setting. We'll call it a, b. So we have these two numbers, a and b. a is how much we move in the x direction, b how much in the y direction. So if I take w dot u, that's really saying a, b dot 2, negative 1 has to equal 2, negative 1 dot 2, negative 1. And the second equation says a, b dot 4, 5 has to be equal to 4, 5 dot 4, 5. Well, keep simplifying. So, here we go. If we take this dot product, we'll get 2a minus b has to be equal to 4 plus 1, which is 5. Then we get 4a plus 5b has to equal 16 plus 25. Well, 16 plus 25 gives 41. All right. Now we're like, whoa, wait. This is great for us. This is the kind of thing we love. Two equations, two unknowns. That's our bread and butter. That's that's our our algebra life. You know, we love doing these kinds of things. So we say, okay, now we're into a place where we're more comfortable. For instance, what can we do? Well, we look for ways to combine to solve. So what I'd like to do is, is look and say, can I cancel something? Well, not as is, but notice if we multiply the first equation by say five, then you'd have a minus 5b. Here's a plus 5b. Oh, that's a good choice. You get cancellation. 2 times 5 is 10. So that's 10a. There's a 4a already there, so that's 14a. Minus 5b plus 5b. No more b's. They're gone. And here you get 25 plus 41, giving us 66. So... That tells us what? A would be 66 over 14. Well, they're both even numbers, so we can divide out by a 2. So that would be 33 over 7. And that's about as far as we can go with A. And now we're halfway done. We found A. So let's see if we can do something similar to find B. So here, let's rewrite our two equations again. 2A minus B equals 5 and 4a plus 5b equals 41. And we say, okay, if I want to cancel off the a's, hey, let's take our first equation, and this time multiply by negative 2. Why negative 2? Well, we're working to cancel the a's. So if you look here, negative 2 times 2a would be negative 4a. The other equation has 4a, 
So when we put them together, there's no more A. <gasps> That's so good. Okay, so what do we have? So again, the A's are gone. Plus 2B plus 5B. 7B. Minus 10 plus 41. Minus 10 plus 41 would be 31, which tells us that B is equal to 31 sevenths. Whoops. And now we just put these two pieces of information together. We have A, we have B. Well, that was our pieces for W. So our answer becomes 33 over 7, comma, 31 over 7. And that's it. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And it worked out so, so nicely. Now, could we think of this geometrically? And actually, we can. Okay, so oftentimes when we have these problems, it's nice to sort of say, hey, is there a geometry involved? And so let's think about what's true. So suppose I, I have my vector here, and I'm going to start, this is, we're going to nail everything down to the same starting point. So here, let's say that this is the vector u. Now, what could I say about the vectors which have the same amount of direction as you? Okay, I have to be careful here. This is going to, it's a hard question to phrase. What can I say about vectors which have this property? When I project onto you, I get you back. Well, here's the picture geometrically. What you do is you come to the end of u, and now what you do is you just go perpendicular. And you can see here that what happens, why perpendicular? Because we want to be a right angle. So that if I have any other vector, like that vector, what happens is when I project, I'm going down to this, straight down to that right angle. So that says whatever w needs to be, it has to be somewhere along here. Okay, so that's one constraint. But remember, we had a second constraint. We said, well, look, there's this other direction, v. And now, what's true? Well, same idea. We say, look, it also has to be the case that I'm perpendicular here. So, what's going to happen, and I'm going to round a space here, but you can see that there's this common point of intersection. This common point of intersection, that's where we're going to have a vector that would project onto u when we say, what's the projection of u? And project onto v when we say, well, what happens with v? And so that intersection, that's what we're after. That's w. So ultimately, that's what we ended up finding if we think about things from a geometrical perspective, which, of course, when we did the algebra, we really obfuscated what was going on. But when we think about the picture, okay, if I'm projecting onto you and I get you back, it really says somehow I lie on my, the end of my vector lies along this, what we'll call a line. And then I have another line, and I'm looking for an intersection of two lines. Okay, so that's how it works from a geometrical perspective. Kind of a fun idea when you see the geometry. It's a really cool thing to be able to see geometry. And of course, since you know, we're in calculus, it's really important to understand geometry. It's, it underpins everything that we do. So let's do another problem. Okay, so we have some vectors u and v, and we're told that they're non-zero. The only reason that we want to specify that they're non-zero is we want to project onto them. One of the things we didn't explicitly state is that when we do projection, we can't project onto the zero vector. If you look at the formula, you'd have to have a divide by zero. Another way to say it is when we're doing projection, we're asking, well, how much of it points in the same direction as what we project onto? Well, the zero vector has no direction. You know, they're like those underwater basket weaving majors, no direction at all. And so we can't talk about projecting onto the direction of the zero vector. Okay, so back to our problem. U and V are non-zero vectors. And now what are we going to do? We're going to take our projection of 
onto U of the projection onto V of U. So it sort of says, okay, take U, how much of that points in the direction of V? Okay, whatever that result is, take that and project it back onto U. And now, what do we want to do? Show that this quantity here, the absolute value of this projection, well, when I say absolute value, really it's a magnitude because projection is a vector, divided by the magnitude of this vector u is between 0 and 1. And the question is, okay, when do you get 0 and when do you get 1? So let's just go through the algebra here and just follow through what it says. So we're going to sort of unwrap this. We're going to be very careful here. So we have the projection onto u of the projection onto v of u. Okay, that's what we want to start with when we say, let's understand this part right here. So, what does this become? Well, let's work from the inside out. That's oftentimes a great way to understand an expression is work from the inside out. This is one of those onion problems. When I say an onion problem, I mean a problem with layers. And some problems in math have layers. Of course, it might be an onion problem, and there might be a couple of tears involved by the time we get to the end. Tears of joy, I'm sure. Uh, as we say, wow, what a beautiful problem. But tears nonetheless. All right. So when we talk about our projection formula, well, since we're projecting onto V, it would be U dot V over V dot V of V. All right. So I'm just working through. So that's what the inside expression is. So now, if I'm projecting it onto u, what do I do is I take that expression, this u dot v over v dot v times v, that's my vector, dot u, okay, because I'm going to dot it with what I'm projecting onto, and I'm going to divide that by u dot u, and this is my coefficient, and I'm scaling it with the vector u. Okay, so now we start to chip away and say, all right, what is this? What is this? Well, there's not too much to chip away. If we actually look at this for a second, we say, hey, here's something. Really, I should be taking the dot product here. This is a vector dot the vector, because this is a scalar, so the scalar we can move out in front. And so what do we have? We have a u dot v, because it doesn't matter which order I, I dot product in. v dot u is the same as u dot v. So what happens is upstairs we have u dot v, v dot v, and then another u dot v. Downstairs we have a u dot u. And this is times u. And, and now we're, we're looking a little bit further and say, ha ha ha. Look, it's beautiful, because we have a u dot v and a u dot v. So really, it's like a u dot v squared. And then, this v dot v, I can move downstairs. So I have a v dot v, and I have a u dot u. And that is what we multiply u by. All right, so there's my coefficient. There's my u. Now we've sort of unwrapped this part. When we take the magnitude, what will we get? So the next step we have is, what is the magnitude of this projection onto u of the projection onto v of u? Well, it is, we take the magnitude of this expression, well, this is just a number, and times it by the magnitude of that vector. So we have the absolute value of u dot v squared over v dot v and u dot u. And then times the magnitude of the vector u. So this is a number, magnitude of a vector. And now we say, ha ha, look back here. We're dividing by the magnitude of u. 
Okay, so what does that tell us? It tells us that our answer to what is this piece on the inside is that part right there. So this is where we want to focus our energy. But let's do a couple of things. First off, do we need the absolute value? And why not? You're right, we don't need the absolute value. And the reason we don't need the absolute value is everything involved here is positive. You see, because we're squaring something, so that means we don't need to worry about it being negative. And whenever I take a vector dot with itself, in fact, that's always going to be a positive number because that's the magnitude of the vector squared. So I don't need the absolute value. Now, upstairs, u dot v would be magnitude of u squared, magnitude of v squared, cosine squared of theta. Because I'm using the fact that u dot v is the magnitude of u, magnitude of v, cosine of theta. I just squared every single term. v dot v would be the magnitude of v squared. u dot u is the magnitude of u squared. And now we say, aha, what happens is some beautiful cancellation. And we see that our magnitude of u squares cancel, our magnitude of v squares cancel, and we end up with cosine squared of theta. So what we have is that this quantity, this quantity right here, this is equal to cosine squared of theta, where theta is the angle between. And now, what do we know? Well, we know if I square something, it can't be negative, so it's greater than or equal to zero. And cosine is at most one, so cosine squared is at most one. And that is why we know that it goes between zero and one. Now, what are the answers? Well, when can we have cosine squared equal to one? So we say, look, it will equal one when cosine of theta is plus or minus one. Well, when is that true? Well, to have cosine theta be plus or minus one, that says that the vectors are parallel. Because if cosine theta is equal to one, that says that the angle theta is equal to zero, so they're pointing in the exact same direction. If cosine theta equals minus one, the angle is pi, they're pointing the exact opposite, and therefore, if I say, look, the value has to be plus or minus one, that says the two original vectors have to be parallel. Well, when does it equal one? Well, that says, sorry, not one, we already did that. When does it equal zero? Well, that says when cosine of theta equals zero. Well, when does cosine of theta equal zero? Well, that says that u and v are perpendicular. In other words, they form a right angle. And so that's the answer. So we've seen that, aha, this quantity that turns out to be cosine squared of the angle between it. And we know that because of what cosine does, it's going to be zero when things are perpendicular. It's going to be one when things are parallel. Otherwise, it'll be something else. Now, what's the picture about what's happening? Well, in some sense, let's see if we can get some intuition here. So we have two directions going on where here's this angle theta. So what happens here is if I have this vector, here's u, and here is v, what I first do is I go down, projection down. If I'm projecting, let's see, where am I going? I'm projecting v onto u. Whoops, ah, so I should have started here. So, so step one, if I project v onto u, says go down to here. So here's step one. And now that's my first step. And then step two says, okay, take that vector and project back up. So that would go back to there. So that's step two. And there we end up bouncing back and forth a little bit like a funhouse mirrors. Okay, so that's sort of an idea of what's going on. All right, well, hmm, a little bit different kind of a question. So. Let's move back to a more traditional type of question. Suppose we have a vector u, which is 1 minus 2, 2, and then we have this expression we're calling R of t. So R of t 
is some vector which depends on t. So in other words, it's a vector which, as we vary t, it, it, it gives us a slightly different vector. And that's not so bad. I mean, it just says, hey, it, it changes with t. We'll, we'll just live with it for right now. So we have this expression, e to the 2t minus 2 sine squared t minus 4, e to the t plus cosine squared t plus t, and t minus 1. So there's a problem. Find a formula for the projection of this expression onto u. Okay, all right, well, that's we'll do that. And determine all times when the projection is a zero vector zero. Okay, all right, well, that should be interesting. So what do we have? Well, let's just do the projection. In some sense, this is really not a bad problem. The only thing that might make this a little bit uncomfortable is we have these t's floating around. But that shouldn't make us feel uncomfortable. It's the same principles. The, the extra t's should not make us change the way we approach anything. So what should we do? Well, we should take our u uh, dot, this thing we're calling r of t, divide by u dot u, and that's going to scale our vector u. So we have, well, minus 1, minus 2, 2, dot e to the 2t minus 2 sine squared t, oh my goodness, minus 4 e to the t plus cosine squared t plus t, oh my gosh, and t minus 1. All of that divide by u dot u. Well, 1 minus 2, 2 dot 1 minus 2, 2. And that's going to scale the vector 1, whoops, 1 minus 2, 2. Okay. There we go. That's just the formula. The formula is what it is. So now we're careful. Do our dot product. So we're going to take minus 1 times the first entry. So minus e to the 2t plus 2 sine squared t plus 4. Minus 2 times the second entry. Wait, why did I put minus 1 here? Hmm, that's because I did a typo. It should be a plus 1, right? 1 minus 2, 2. All right, so I, it's just the first entry. No minus sign. 1, that's still a minus, and that's still a minus. Good. Copy errors. Copy errors are one of the worst things because it's just, there's not a lot you can do to prevent other than say, wait, is that the same? And if it's not, then whoops, go back and fix it. Now, how do you, well, I can't say prevent copy errors, but how do you minimize the damage? Well, the answer is you frequently keep checking, like, okay, did I copy it down correctly? And or if something feels like, this is getting weird, I'm not sure that I've copied this correctly. Well, maybe you didn't, and so you go back and you check your work. Okay, so now minus 2 times the middle entry. So minus 2 e to the t minus 2 cosine squared t minus 2t. Then 2 times the last entry, plus 2t minus 2. All of that divided by, well, 1 uh, plus 4 plus 4. And that's scaled by the vector 1 minus 2, 2. Okay, so let's clean this up. Let's see what we have. So we have the e of the 2t. There's really nothing that combines with that. Now, we have a sine squared t and a cosine squared t. So those combine, and if we combine those, that'll be a sine squared and a cosine squared becomes 1. There's a minus 2 involved, so it's a minus 2. Notice that back at the end, there's another minus 2. So that gets us up to minus 4. Oh, whoops. There's another minus 4 there. Uh -huh. So that's actually up to minus 8. Okay, did we get everything? So there's a minus 2 from the sine squared to cosine squared, a minus 4, and a minus 2. Okay, good. That's everything. We got it. Okay, then what? Well, there's a minus 2e to the t. So minus 2e to the t. All right, and then anything else? Well, a minus 2t and a plus 2t, they cancel. Life is good. All right, good. Well, now what? Hmm, that's the numerator downstairs 
is the denominator, 9. And of course, that's your coefficient, scaling 1, negative 2, 2. So this is the projection. Good, good. We're halfway done. Well, what do we mean half? What's the other half? Well, we've got to answer the question that comes with the word and. So the and says, find all the times when the projection is the zero vector. Well, what could cause it to be the zero vector? What we need is to have the outcome of this projection be zero. The zero vector is not going to come from the vector on the end or from the nine downstairs. So what we need to do is say, well, what can we say about when e to the 2t minus 2e to the t minus 8 equals 0? Can we figure that out? Now, that looks kind of not easy at first glance because it's like, oh, this is an exponential function. That's How do we handle exponential functions? Especially when you start seeing things with lots of addition and subtraction. If things are just being multiplied, it's like, hey, let's try some logs. But, but that's not happening here. But there's a little thing we can do. Notice this isn't just e to the t. It's e to the 2t. So in some sense, these are not quite compatible. It's like apples and other kinds of apples. We'd like them to look more similar. And we can actually rewrite e to the 2t to make it look more like e to the t. It can be rewritten as e to the t squared. So e to the t squared minus 2e to the t minus 8 equals 0. And now we have our great, ah, here's an idea. So if you let y equal e to the t. So I'm just introducing this new variable. Then it looks like this is the same as saying y squared minus 2y minus 8 equals 0. And now it's a quadratic. That's something we're more comfortable with. Not only is it a quadratic, it's a quadratic that factors. Uh, it's suspicious how often things factor here, isn't it? Well, it's because we've been living a good, clean algebra life. So this factors, and uh, if you factor, it's not too bad. You'll see it, it factors as y minus 4 and y plus 2. Because that's uh, two things need to multiply together to give negative 8, add to give negative 2. You can check, right? y squared, good. 2y minus 4y, minus 2, and minus 8. Beautiful. So that gives us two possibilities, namely y equals 4 or y equals negative 2. But remember, we're trying to find all the times, which we should really think of, he didn't say it explicitly, but we should think of times as being t, all the times when we got 0 out. We, and y is just a substitute name. It's a very common thing to do in math where we say, well, let's give this a temporary name and work out and see what happens. So if we put our original name back, you get e to the t equals 4 or e to the t equals negative 2. Now, one of these is going to be good and one of them is not going to be as good. It's going to cause a problem. Which one of these two is a problem? Well, e to the t, it's a very optimistic function. It's always positive. It's looking on the bright side of life. So whenever I have e to the t equals a negative, that can't ever happen. e to the t can never be negative. And so this possibility e to the t equals negative 2, well, nope, it won't happen. e to the t is never negative 2 in our class. So we see, aha, that says, well, in order for things to work out, e to the t would have to equal 4, and therefore we come to the conclusion t would need to be the natural log of 4. So that's the time when we see that if we did our projection, it would be 0. In other words, that's the time when they're exactly perpendicular. They're orthogonal to each other. Now, if you're wondering where did this last step come from, well, we just need to bring the t down. And the way you bring t down from an exponential function is by using a logarithm. All right, well, good. Whew. We're going to work a lot more with, with what we call vector-valued functions. That's coming up in a very 
near future where we think of a, a vector varying with t. Last little idea here. So in physics, we have work. And work is the product of force and distance. So if I, you know, if I'm moving an object a certain amount, and I say, well, how much work did I do? I say, well, how heavy was it? How many pounds was it? How far did I move it? How many feet? Well, then I multiply the two quantities together. Okay, so that's great. Now that works if we really think of things in a one-dimensional things, like I'm, I'm pushing along. What if we go to higher dimensions? Okay, we now can still apply force, and force has an amount of force, so that's the magnitude, and a direction in which it's applied. And so that means that a force is a vector. What happens to distance? Well, distance is going to re be replaced by another D word. We're going to call it displacement. So displacement is how much did you move? Now, it doesn't have to be the case that in one dimension, see if I'm applying a force, I'm everything's going in the same way. But it might be that I'm applying a force, but the displacement is slightly off. It's Imagine, for instance, you're helping to push a friend's car. And you're on the side helping to push because there's so many people that they already took all the good spots in the back. Well, you're pushing at an angle that's not the same. The car's moving forward, but you're pushing at a slightly askew angle. And so you have to sort of compensate for these. So the question is, okay, previously, so this is our old version. We said that work is just force times distance. We want to say now, what happens if we go to our new setting where we have vectors involved? So to be explicit here, what we want to look at is we want to say we have a force being applied. So here is our vector, our force. And now there's also a second component, which is our displacement. And our displacement is how much our, we've, we've changed, our, our change in our object. Okay, and so the question is, okay, if you apply the force and the end result is this displacement, how much work was done? So how do we find the answer? Well, what we need to do is really think about what happened. So to do that, we think about our, our picture. So we're going to say, look, we're still going to talk about our, our force and our distance, but we have to say, what's the right setting for force? Well, what we're going to do here is we're going to come down, and uh, this is a little bit too misleading, my picture. Let's make our distance a little bit longer. There we go. Here's our displacement, lots of displacement. So when we think about our force, we really want to say, well, let's ask the question, how much force is going in the direction of the displacement? So we're interested in that. So we look at our picture here and we say, well, the amount of force that's going in the, the distance, in the, sorry, excuse me, the amount of force that's going in the direction of displacement is going to be whatever this length is. So this is the amount of force in the direction of displacement. In other words, what we were calling just F before. So whatever that length is, is F. On the other hand, if we look at the length here, so this length is equal to the distance that we moved, which means it's that part right there. So what we want to do is we want to say, let's figure out what's the length there, what's the length there, multiply things together, and then we have our new formula. Well, let's dig into it. So if we're going through here, well, this is not so bad. So we know that this latter part here is just going to become the magnitude of d. So that's like our displacement becomes the magnitude, uh, our distance becomes the magnitude of our displacement. 
you can tell I'm not a physics person because I'm getting uh, a little bit tripped up here. But we'll get there. We'll get there. Just bear with me. Another thing is, of course, that the words displacement and distance are so similar. They start with both the dis. So dis is going to be a little bit hard to keep track of. All right. So we've now said, hey, our distance is represented by the magnitude of displacement. Now the force, we have to use the force. Use the force, Luke. Use the force. So where does that come into play? That's going to be coming into play by projection. If we think of here, this as an angle, theta, then what I have is that if I take the length of the hypotenuse in this right triangle times the cosine of this angle, that's the length of the adjacent side. So the amount of force that actually is being used to move the object in the direction of our displacement is the magnitude of f cosine theta. So this part is f. So that's what it becomes. Now, if you look at this expression, and you don't have to look very long, you say, wait a second, there's something really nice here. If we rewrite it as a little bit different, it's magnitude of f, magnitude of d, cosine theta, that is a very particular expression. Magnitude of vector, magnitude of vector, cosine of the angle between the vector says this is a dot product. So this is our new setting. So we went from work equals force times distance to work equals force dot displacement. So we end up adding a dot. But in some sense, that's really great because it says, hey, you know what? It kind of translates in a very nice way from our old setting to our new setting. It all works out in a rather intuitive, beautiful format. So that's the idea. So that's how it, it translates. So the good news is things work very similar. And so once you understand how vectors work, you say, look, there's a lot of intuition and a lot of the things that we figured out how things work in one dimension we can translate now into higher dimensional settings, which is good. Now we've got more power and more tools. All right, well, that's it for our practice. Thanks for being so patient and keep coming back. We have more things to learn and more things to practice. So see you again. Bye.